Well, why don't we okay. go ahead start. and get okay. started. Um, thank you everybody for coming here today. Uh, this should be, a, I think, a really interesting presentation, um, or at least the part that Michael's doing. <laughs> I'm only doing a small part of it. Um, so, uh, and by the way, um, you, everybody make sure and open their their chip bags first <laughs> before we start because <laughs> they that. make a lot of noise on the recording. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do today is uh, Michael's going to start and then I'm going to speak a little bit towards the end. There's uh, continuing legal education credit if you want to sign up for that. Um, if you're a lawyer, I can't imagine why you would want to. If you weren't a lawyer, um, it's up there. And um, of course, lunch back here and feel free to get up and get anything you like during this time. So we will go ahead and start. Um, I'd like to introduce Michael Herzog. Uh, he's the CEO of NextB. NextB uh, has been in the business of doing open source audits and compliance uh, services for over eight years. Um, if you have uh, perhaps come to some of our previous presentations, uh, this is another in a series of presentations that we've done on really specific topics relating to open source compliance. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about compliance issues that relate to uh, containers. And um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for hosting the event and our lovely view, which probably won't be on the video. Um, uh, so again, I'm Michael, the CEO of NextB. I'm uh, <coughs> hands-on with doing software audits and software compliance work, and we've recently become in, involved with several customer projects where uh, they asked us to look at what do we do when we start using Docker to actually deploy our, our system, and uh, we found it to be a, a bit harder than we actually thought. Um, we worked out some methodology. It took actually three full tries to get something efficient. So we're basically going to talk today about you know, what we learned from that. Um, there, uh, one comment is that you'll get copies of the slides, and there's relatively detailed notes about various things in the slides that I'll kind of, but aren't on the slides that you'll see today. So we were going to talk about just very high level overview of Docker. This is kind of a business legal view. It's, you're not learning how to use Docker. There's lots of great documentation out there for that. And I'm going to talk a little about where we see the, the new governance challenges, governance compliance challenges. Um, and Heather's going to talk about how that, that fits in the legal framework and some of the um, very basic things people can do in terms of process and, and how they organize their activities. And at the end, I'm just going to make a few comments on some ideas about uh, some of the automation one could do, some things that would change uh, in how you handle your Docker deployments. So um, first thing is, what is Docker? Uh, this is from the, you know, the Docker web page. It's, it's basically a way to deploy applications in a self-contained a self system. Um, they call it a, a container because that's, uh, you think, you know, you'll see the imagery all over with the container stacked on top of the whale. Um, but basically, it's a standardizing units of deployment. And it's extremely um, popular these days. Uh, the, the motto is kind of build, ship, run. And one of the things we're talking about is uh, one of the challenges is this kind of blurring the boundaries between what's being developed and how it's prepared for deployment or distribution. It's kind of a continuous flow. And so some of the checkpoints and the um, control points that people are used to uh, don't apply in this context. And of course, it doesn't apply to everything. So um, it means essentially enterprise applications. It's not specific to deploying on the web, um, but we're not likely to see the containers on our phones anytime soon or you know, various kinds of devices. So it's not universal, but it's certainly picking up speed. So um, Docker is a company and a software project, and the company sponsors the project, and they provide uh, relatively recently a range of services uh, essentially, the model is very similar to GitHub, where lots of public uh, data, software, tools are available. And then if you want to have a private registry or private system, then you pay uh, for the, for the uh, extra control security. That's kind of the general business model, very similar to GitHub. Um, so wh why is it such a hot topic? Well, 
Actually, the technology it's based on is a, is a uh, Linux container technology that's been around since 2008. So that's not brand new. But the Docker people came up with uh, a way of making that accessible, making that useful, and, and very, very easy to use. So they came up with essentially a set of applications, of you know, developers and deployment applications, to make it easy to use. The technology, however, has been around for a while. It's uh, under a permissive license, uh, Apache license. Um, and it basically came out of the box with pretty good integration with a lot of the most popular uh, development tools. So it, you know, it's kind of a, I don't know, I guess analogy might, it's kind of like, a, you know, the iPhone. Apple, Apple didn't invent phones, they didn't invent smartphones, but they sure hit hard with a, a very, very good combination of features and functions and accessibility, and that's what opened up the market. So that's really where, where Docker is, that's the way to think about it. There are competitors, uh, something called CoreOS, that like with any technology, they have disagreements on how to use containers, so there's other people, um, but they're very prominent. And I think one of the big things that happened last year was that Microsoft signed on uh, to using Docker technology with their Azure cloud. That was kind of like, they're really hitting their stride when they're getting Microsoft to wake up and, and make, work with that. It's generally designed for the cloud, but again, any kind of applications deployed doesn't really need to be on the cloud. And, Another way to think about it is, you know, we've had a virtualization wave for a while with VMware and various kinds of virtual machines, and Docker's kind of riding, riding on top of the wave. Those are, you know, sort of our perspective, not, you know, uh, anyone else. So this is a slide from um, uh, the website trying to explain simply the difference between a container and a virtual machine. So on the left, you have a virtual machine. On the right, you have containers. Again, not exclusively Docker, but, you know, pretty much <coughs> the same idea. And essentially, you can you know you can see pretty clearly in the middle the differences. So on a, a virtual machine, you have your infrastructure, you have something that runs the hardware, the hypervisor, and then for each of your apps or your systems, you have pretty much a full guest operating system. So you have a full copy of Linux, or it could be Windows, or it could be whatever. And then up top, you have your your applications. Bin slash lives is just referring to different kinds of executables, binary executables, like you know, command line things and, and libraries. Um, and there's quite a bit of overhead involved in all this. So that you know, there's, there's no sharing, there's sharing of the hardware and the sharing of the underlying system, but each of those applications on the virtual machine side has its own guest operating system. It's a, it's a full blown system. And so what the containers do is they use Linux technology that says, I can really share the operating system and I can run my application by sharing operating system resources, but I only need one operating system. And it does need to be Linux these days, or Linux somehow, it can be in a virtual machine. Whatever. But basically, I'm using this container technology so that um, each of my apps can, ma Linux can manage the memory allocation, the disk allocation, all the other functions um, directly at the operating system layer, or separate processes. So I don't have to have a full operating system there. It's a lot, lot less overhead. Um, so that's the simple version of, of it. Um, it does, however, uh, and it gives you great, so it's, it's more efficient. Um, it uh, gives a lot of simplicity to developers because they can just worry about those thinner top layers. They don't really have to worry too much about the, uh, the whole stack. Uh, but then also leads to complexities, which we'll talk about. And, and it has to do with uh, somehow the ease of, basically the ease of use uh, is, seems to lead to a pattern where people are actually using a lot more software inside their container than they need to. And, and there's, you know, we like to say laws of physics still apply. So, you know, you still have to update your image, your containers, you know, if you have a patch, you still got to apply it. And you got to do all kinds of things that you might have done. The, previously at the operating system level, you just would have patched your Linux installation. Well, now bits of that can be running in various places. So you have to figure out how to do your patching. So it's, it, it's definitely, you know, faster, more efficient. And, and very much scalable. So another thing you hear about is, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit, but the idea of these, uh, of, of Docker is you can run, you run these in containers. So if I have an application where I want to scale the number of services, uh, registration service or a Netflix uh, serving up uh, your video, I can spawn 20 of them and just open them up and shut them down and it's much more flexible rather than launching. Again, if you, you, know, if you turn on an operating system, it takes, three, four, or five minutes for everything to boot, you know, till you get your prompt. If you launch a container, it takes seconds. So it's just, it's just that kind of uh, 
kind of logic. Um, so just be very, um, the next slide, just very quickly with terminology again, assuming you're not familiar. So a container is where you run the software. So you, in the container, you run something called a Docker image. And an image is basically the software. Um, it's organized as what's called a root file system. So that's how <coughs> it's organized the same way software is organized when you run in a system on Linux. It's, and it has to be, because that's what it is. Um, and it has some parameters and other, you know, other information there, but it's basically um, a slice of the root file system running on top of Linux. And each can, each image is is broken up into layers, which is where a lot of the complexity comes in. We'll talk about that. A Docker file is a set of instructions to create a layer. It's essentially like a make file or a configuration file, of course. And then the registry is a repository of images. So Docker. Uh, the Docker Hub is a public repository of pre-built images, and, and people can have private uh, images also. So um, these are just words you'll see all the time. Uh, only Docker file is capitalized normally, so when you see going forward the word image or whatever will be lowercase, that's just the way things are done. So this is kind of, just have two slides, but they're very, very important to understand what's going on. So. Your, your goal is to is to run some software in a container in this isolated controlled environment. Um, you have to build your image file ahead of time, and again, that image file could be deployed to ten containers or one container. And there's two basic pieces. You have to start with a base image. So a base image is usually a subset of certain Linux utilities and so on that you want to make sure you have. And then you have a series of Docker file commands. So um, there's plenty of information on the web. We have some resources listed at the end, some videos listed at the end of the presentation if you want to know how to actually run this stuff. But the simple idea is that I start with the base image, and what that image is is very, very important, not fully appreciated. And then I add to that with the Docker file. So from add, run, CMD, or just different commands that I can execute in the inside the Docker file, and that builds up these layers. So, yes, the base image file has all of your executable business logic. No, it's it's very often a, a, an initial Linux distro of some sort. It's no, typically will not have your application. You'll be building that up from your Docker file. Thank you. So it's it's most often um, some infrastructure type software. So you, so, you, so let's say you're going to run Node, there might be already a pre-built Node system, so you run kind of the software, or if you had a, a Java system, you might already have something that has the open JDK and some of the utilities underneath it. Your stuff's going to come in in the front Docker file. So it, it's a little complicated here, but the, the idea is um, this is built up in layers, and, and the ordering is important. So at the bottom, we're trying to show I have a base image. So those just came from somewhere. From let, Let's say you were running a Java environment, and that it has some very basic files to run Java in it, like the OpenJDK. And then you add as many layers as you want. Um, it once was, used to be limited to 42, I think you can do 128 now. Um, and it can essentially do any of these arbitrary commands. So from is the command to get your base, and the others add, I can just add programs from any file system. One of the problems is, one of the good things is very powerful, one of the bad things is you can come from anywhere. I can copy something from somewhere, I can run an installation. I can run a command in to get some code and install it, and uh, I can run command line and so on. So at each layer, I can do essentially what's equivalent of a you know any sort of development commands that I want. And they, the, the challenge we're going to talk about is they're not particularly controlled as to where you do it from. So you can you keep installing pieces as you go, and you it, you know if you're installing um, some third-party system, you it may have prerequisites that also have to be installed. Or you may want to run an update. You want to say, update these components. I know my Linux kernel that I'm not even looking at below me is, is at version 6. I might want to run certain updates, and I run the Linux command to update them. So it's, it's, it's totally open what you can do here. It's very, very powerful. Not that most make systems can't do a lot of things, but there's a lot of conventions that have grown up over time. Um, so basically, each one of those, I, I, I know, so the, the red line is saying, I got all I got zero to three from the base, and then, you know, each command creates what's called a layer. One of the one of the interesting challenges is that the layers, you know, keep accumulating, <coughs> um, and it is possible to do, and we've seen this, 
that I could have a, a certain component um, installed, the, the red box is saying I have a certain version of it installed at layer two. Later on, I install it at layer five, four. The container technology uses a, a, a Linux utility. I can't remember the name of it. The unified file system utility. So it kind of looks down from the top. It's like layers of a pane. So it always takes the uh, program from the highest level. So you may, one of the challenges, particularly in compliance, is you may have hidden versions of things that you don't really want to distribute, but, and they're not really visible to you unless you dig. So if you're running the system, you don't see that application or that GPL3 line <coughs> component, but it could still be in the path. So basically that, an image is this set of layers with a base image at the bottom. That's, that's what an image is. And that, that then is your functioning system. So typically you're building up things that you need to run your application, and then somewhere near the top, you're actually installing the latest version of what your, your application is. Mike, Michael, yep. you said uh, we wouldn't see this in smartphones anytime soon. Is it, is it really only getting used for SaaS uh, models and web services, or is it, could it be in a set-top box eventually, or well, some other Linux it, it could be. Product? I mean, there's no particular limit. I, in fact, smartphones may be there someday. Um, but it's also, you know, it means you have a fluid environment. So, so the, the idea is you're going to spawn processes. So, you know, if you're running on a phone, you run one process at a time. Someday we'll have something more, right? But the idea of spawning five copies of something on a smartphone doesn't quite make sense. But if I'm running a website or some business application and my, van, my demand is variable, and of course it means I had to architect my application with that idea. It has to be broken down into pieces. I mean, to really make advantage of it. That's where you're going to see most of it. There's no particular difference between the reason it would need to be on a private cloud, a public cloud versus a private cloud. There's nothing software as a service specific, but it typically be larger scale applications where this scalability is, is a distinct advantage. I wouldn't see it on a set-top box because you're basically burning an image and you aren't updating it frequently. So one of the, one of the keys here is that you're also frequently updating this, this code and launching, you know, Again, launching 20 containers in the morning and going down to one in the afternoon, and you know, uh, so it, it's that kind of uh, use model that makes the most sense for containers today. Um, one other interesting artifact that we find in a lot of the Docker is, uh, since you start having this scalability, it's like almost any time you have an application, there's a companion monitor application. So you, everything's like a twofer, because if I'm going to be running one to 20 instances of something, I have to have some way to <coughs> monitor all that. Right. And then there's other consist other issues like, you know, if you're running a database and you want a persistent database, you have to run that differently because you don't want to, you, you know, you want the database to be persistent. So there's a lot, lots of details. But the idea is for these, you know, <coughs> relatively higher volume applications, it gives you a lot of that scale. Does that make sense? I mean, inherently, it's not limited to that, but that's the... Those may, the it may come up when we're talking yeah. about compliance with open source, yeah, right? right? right. So, so again, this, get this, the idea here is, is the layers. That's the key. So those, just want to get those kind of you know, words in front of you or that idea in front of you about what it looks like. But the challenge is, is that um, this way of building, and it's also designed for going straight, you know, very quickly from development to deployment. So it's saying the developer can now have a virtual technology to replicate the deployment environment in, in great detail, and you don't have to go through the same cycle. So the whole idea is I can do those frequent updates, I can ship them or uh, deploy them directly. And you know, typically there's been control points. Uh, a long time ago we used to talk about open source being different because there's no purchasing department that would control what software you used, right? You didn't have to go to purchasing. In the old days if you had to go to purchasing that was good control. Maybe other disadvantages, but it was good control. Um, here there's a, the idea is that you know there's things devs off people are, are learning and, and are being pretty smart about, but it's really not as clear what the packaging is if you're shipping a product, and if you're deploying it, you know you're not translating. So I give you a build and then you run it through system integration and then you run it and package it again and we have you know those cycles don't fit so well. You lose the velocity that you're getting, the flexibility you're getting if you impose those rules. So. Um, that's what we see the, the governance challenges is, is the technology is kind of leapfrogging the traditional process. And there are people worrying about this, thinking about it, but it, but it creates a compliance problem. Um, and a, a couple things come up. One is we see a lot of, uh, case, in the cases we've seen so far, not that many, but uh, basically there's a, this freedom to pull software from anywhere. And there's a tendency in, in modern software development to use external repo repositories. Um, 
So a from command, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a add command may go, doesn't have, you know, if you, unless you've locked down your system and there's no internet access to your development system, meaning your individual developer now, not, not some controlled server, they may, they may grab that copy of something from just about anywhere. And it may, it may not be bad, but you just don't know. Um, so that's one of the, the challenges. Um, and then these commands can be, again, when you're, you can say install this, and part of that installation is it will invoke other dependencies. So you just, you get a lot of software that you may not be fully aware of. And, and, and that, that's a big part of the challenge. Um, a very, very important point um, is that uh, it's very popular right now to use base images from the public Docker hub. So you have, you have them from you know, an Ubuntu image, you have a CentOS image by these, these organizations are maintaining them. But there's not really any clarity about what's in there. So when you do yeah. add command, basically, the, the developer build a library from the web service? From wherever he wants. Yeah, I mean, it's command. It, okay. You know, it can say add, add file X from HTTP.S or any kind of location. It's a pretty open. But, but the, the location then is on the, the, the build, on the, on the main image. You have all the components on the image, or it's every time you run the, the each layer command, you get whatever that command resulted in. If it's yeah, it, it's packaged inside the tool, or it's when you run the container. When you create, yeah. When, well, so it's in the image. The software has been added from yeah, wherever. Yeah, okay. It's inside the image. When you run the container, you spawn the container. People like to say spin up the container. Yeah. That's when it starts running. Yeah, but you don't call the outside API. No, oh, no, 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 no. The software is, well, oh, yeah. unless that's what the application actually does. If you could have an application that explicitly does that as part of its logic. But no, no, no it's not rebuilding it at that time. It's, it's frozen inside the container. Very, very good point. It's, you know, it's not dynamically being built as you run it, it's built and fixed. So that's good news, as long as you know what's in there. Does that make sense? It, it, you know, it, it definitely is frozen. At the time you run it, it's a read-only image. It's, you know, it's not, you know, if you have a database function, then you need to have a, a way that you're accessing the database where the data is stored. It's not something that you modify the software while it's running. Yeah, that would be even scarier. Um, so the, we're going to come back <coughs> to the specific challenges, but the base images um, are a great public service. They get you started real quickly. Um, there, we're not the only ones talking about this, but there are issues about um, understanding exactly what's in there, and it's not easy for the projects that provide, you know, so if the image comes from CentOS, you have some, you know, you have some certainty that CentOS people created it and they know what they're doing, but they're constantly updating it, and if I were a, a, a maliciously oriented person, what better place to insert something somehow than in this image that, you know, people can be copying ad hoc? Right, so so it's just it's just a new area where again the, the controls haven't caught up with um, the, the, the possible downside. Not aware of a you know a breach in that area, but um, it's it's one of the traceability issues is how do you figure out what's in it. So you so you're always starting from some <coughs> base image. It doesn't have to be public, but one of the things that gets people going quickly is most of these major technologies, you know Node whatever they have public images available. So why wouldn't I start with that? Is a, is a good kind of developer uh, orientation. Um, so that gets to this sort of thing about uh, traceability. So you can get things from anywhere. Again, you know, if you lock down every developer so they can't access the internet, then the, the add command will fail. But that's not very common. Um, we talked a bit about how the images, the, you know, the image has these layers, and when you're running the image, when you're operating the software, you only see the top level. So there's things that are buried inside there. And the most important thing is there's no standard yet for what you would consider a build log. Not that there's ever been a complete standard. But tracing what actually happened is, is not, one of, not been one of the priorities, um, which is understandable for new technology. So there's nothing that actually tells you can interrogate the layers and see what the commands were. You can see what's there. But there may be a lot of missing pieces, like what, where was that really accessed from, who owns that. URL, that sort of thing. So, so what we found in, in, in the way we traditionally do our work, um, we do what we call tracing code through a build to say, okay, you know, this source code became this object file, became this executable file. This is the how, what's being delivered to the customer and where it came from. <coughs> there's, no, there's no binding between the Docker file and the container image? Well, the Docker files are, you can, the Docker files are not in the image. Um, I mean, you, if you have access to the image, you can trace a lot of it, but it's not easy. And these Docker files are, can be like 40, 50 deep, and they have all this convenient uh, SHA-1 naming convention. So the name of the layer, I can't remember, the, it's a string of about 40 characters or something. So it's 
kind of counterintuitive to, to see what's in there. So it's really, you know, it's taken us quite a while to think about different strategies to, to figure that out. Um, but the, these containers are also things, uh, images, they want them to be light. And, you know, in, in general, uh, <coughs> that means not don't leave a lot of documentation in there. You don't need to, you know, leave a lot of things. The build file can be very, well, it's never that big as a text file, but it can be a huge file. So the idea is to keep it stripped down. That's one of the objectives. But along the way, there isn't isn't a clear way to actually, it, it, using the default mechanisms, there isn't a clear way to do the traceability. So once you've got it created, uh, we would we would venture if you asked the developer to provide an inventory of exactly what, every, what everything is in there and where it came from, that they would have a hard time doing that. Um, probably the big things they know about what their philosophy is. So people, you know, and there's also a lot of experimentation. So developers are, it seems like they're redundantly installing software a lot of times, examples we've seen, or they're installing at this higher layer things that they should be using from the base image. So one of the real challenges here is you, you have this idea of, okay, I can just install Linux, and then I don't need to worry about upgrading my Linux version. I'll just keep putting it in the, in the image. But eventually that gets to be lots of layers you know, of, of updates and patches and whatever, and it becomes a little ridiculous to trace that, whereas you say, okay, periodically I need to go refresh my base image. So if you're running CentOS 6 as your base image, just meaning that's the base. And it turns out you're really mostly using CentOS 7. The number of pieces of software you're installing to upgrade to 7 within the, the image is a lot. You should consider going back and just resetting to 7, right? Because you're starting to create a lot of cropped, a lot of accretion in those layers that's hard to trace. And that, and again, from a compliance perspective, so, you know, if you're installing lots of Linux utilities, so an example that someone may install a utility you would never think of shipping, under GPL3, they install it, they run some commands inside the Docker files, and then they uninstall it, but actually it's still in there. So it's kind of a technical point, but there may be a dependency and they want to install a certain version of something. So something you would, in your normal environment, would never be shipped. So we is now shipped. It's still there because it's uninstalled because it's a common, but it's still on the image. Because right, because it's, it's in the layer. It may not be visible anymore. It, you know, it doesn't run, but it's in there because the uninstall doesn't remove it. It just executes the next command that says, okay, I installed it here. Now I'm going to uninstall it. Well, the install command is still in there. So do, do you see like <clears throat> developers for convenience, they, they have a, a layer, for example, that they add that it may include a bunch of other software that they don't even use? They don't really need exactly. Right? Yeah. At the end, from a compliance perspective, you have other software that is not being even used on the, right. on the... Right, And it also may be that you took a base image for convenience, and it has a lot of stuff you don't need. Right? I mean, it's very easy. Again, you know, wh who wouldn't... If you just were given this problem, let's get started. Set the CentOS open source project has a pre-built image. Why wouldn't I use that? For, you know, from a general developer perspective, well, yeah, that's a good idea. And I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it's got some risks associated with it. So, so maybe we'll we call that later, but so if I have a layer to remove the GPL component, components still there, but are you still responsible for the... Uh... Well, Heather's going to cover that part, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's an argument that you are. <laughs> so, Sorry, Mark, yeah, one no, more no, quick thing. When you, when you build these base images and you pull them in, say from this open source cent, CentOS... Yeah, the CentOS. It, it doesn't... It's pulling in just the... It, uh, what the binary? The software, whatever they decide to put in there. But it's not. It's not creating. It's not bringing in the exact source code and all the license text. Well, no. So exactly to, to exactly that point, um, it's it's being maintained by the CentOS project. If we just pick on that because we see CentOS a lot, mm -hmm. and they're constantly updating with patches, so that's a good thing. But in fact, they've explicitly stripped out all the normal license text that would be in in a normal distro, even a binary distro of Linux CentOS, you would have license notices. They stripped those out to make it um, simpler. So right. So when you build a base image, are you just pulling in the binary? Well, it's up to you what you pull in. That's uh, okay. I'm saying one of the problems with some oh, of the so public the images is they, public images in the are source. definitely not providing the source at the same time because that would be a lot of extra space taken up, right? They aren't thinking of that side <clears> of things. <throat> and then in particular, we ran into an issue with CentOS where the, the team seems quite aware and not worried that they've actually stripped out licenses. So if you've got a normal binary, not the source, just the binary distribution of a Linux distro, normally there'd be lots of licenses in there, lots of copying files, and not necessarily everything, but it would just come with. So there was an effort to strip it out because it was considered, you know, ancillary data. I want my image to be as small as possible. So just they're just 
that'll change over time, but there's just that that is a pattern that we see. Is it, I'm focusing on making this thing scalable and fast and small. I don't want anything in there that I don't need to run the image. So very good, very good question there. Um, so we've kind of talked about this already, but again, the you know uh, exactly that point I just made is you know. There seems to be patterns. It's not this, it's not all the same. So you know, if you go to the Docker public hub, um, some of the pages there's an official registry, or again, CentOS, Node.js, lots of very very common Ubuntu cloud packages. Sometimes they have license at least on their home page for that uh, that uh, image. Sometimes they don't say anything uh, at all. Um, and then inside the actual images, there doesn't seem to be much uh, going on in terms. You know, it seems like the license and copyright notices are stripped out. And there's certainly no corresponding source if that's required. It's just if you think about the logic of this, there's a good reason why you wouldn't include the source. But uh, the license of copyright notices don't take up that much space if you think about it. Um, and the key point here, um, which Heather will also address, is bottom line is if you're shipping this or you're deploying this, and obviously deploying it in the on a cloud is a different risk profile than shipping it. But in either case, you're the one doing it, so you've inherited whatever obligations exist, right? There's the, can't go back and just say, you know, I got this from somewhere. You know, that's never worked, right? You never could say that. It says if I'm actually the one distributing this or ship or deploying this, then I'm responsible, whatever those obligations are, even if I don't know what they are. Is, is MongoDB available on this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so at least some AGPL is. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Is and in. lots of GPL three you might you might not know. You know, again, the, there's been this trend on Linux where projects at the application level have been gradually migrating to the 3.0 licenses. And it just kind of happens over time. <coughs> um, so um, that's the public side. On the private side, um, when you're working with the, the private side of your images, again, we don't have the audit log. Um, it just, it seems to have just circumvented some of the normal controls about where you pull things. So, you know, it may also depend on your company's policy. Most companies we work with, larger companies, want to bring their uh, Java Maven repo in-house and use a private one, not use the public one. There's no rule that says you can't, but there could be surprises. Same thing with any of these repos. There's a control issue, and there's lots of dimensions to that. But the nature of this being a new technology and being so easy to use seems to encourage uh, more freedom in how people acquire uh, the packages they need. And with newer technologies, the, the layers of dependencies are just exponentially increasing. A lot of our business these days is much less looking at source code and much more just seeing what's the dependency trail. Because it can be two and three levels deep and you just don't know that I'm actually installing this thing because it's all done for you automatically, right? It's all out there. So so that's one of their key points. Um, from our side, um, we're, we're encouraging people and it's come up a little bit later, you probably should be thinking about building your own private base image. That's the safe thing to do. Not incredibly hard to do, and that's probably one of the ideas. Um, and uh, you know, again, your obligations apply. Uh, you know, whether, whenever you ship or deploy, one of the things you should also be thinking about is, well, if I'm responsible for this, you know, it's it's one thing if I'm going to use something publicly posted, like a you know an Ubuntu uh, uh, image from Docker Hub. On the other hand, if I'm getting something from a supplier, I want them to do their part, right? I don't want to inherit whatever. Uh, obligations they didn't think about. So that's still very new, but you know there are people shipping products on Docker, so that would be something to think about. So you know the, the questions at this point are probably maybe a little obvious, but it's what's in here. Understanding exactly what components you have is not trivial. Um, you can't at the end, at the top layer, there's effectively a composite root file system, so you can see everything, every program, if you will. But where it came from may not be clear. So you may have certain utilities from Linux, and the name will tell you, you know, what they did. I mean, you know, uh, grep, right, or something. But exactly where that came from, what distro, what version of source you're obliged to redistribute under GPL 2.0, not at all clear. It's just you know it's grep. Um, so it's it's about understanding those layers. And what are my attribution obligations, my redistribution obligations? How am I actually going to do that? Because a lot of these containers, they aren't running as a you know, an application with a graphical user interface that can be spawned many times. How am I actually going, going to go about doing that? That's, that's kind of the, the big challenge. So what's in there? You know, what are my obligations? Usually I know what can figure those out if I know what's in there. Um, but how do I actually, you know, uh, uh, apply this to the rules I currently have? If I currently 
use a standard Linux distro, commercial or open source, I can typically pass that through. I can say, okay, you know, whether I tell you to install it, that's one thing, or if I pass through a Red Hat distro, then I just give you the whole Red Hat thing and I've done it, right? I mean, I, I've complied, or as far as most people see it, and of course that distro, that big, you know, two-part DVD or whatever will have all the notices and all the source code and you just, you know, more or less bypass the big problem. Here, you're doing much more granular work, so what's actually in there um, is not clear, and it, there's no guarantee that it even comes from one distro. So when you're doing these work at different layers, maybe maybe the developers started using Red Hat, but they grabbed something they wanted from Fedora, and they grabbed it something they wanted from CentOS. There's no way to guarantee that it's all from one location. So do you know at least what, what was a ba base image when you look at the container? Or the you can inter I mean, the base image is just a set of layers, so you can interrogate like everything else. But but do you know? You will know. You'll be able to see what it was from the from command. Will tell you what. Yeah. what so if you are able to go back to the uh, Docker hub <coughs> and see this was this tool. Yeah. The the, the, version. Yeah, yeah. You'll be able to track that. But there's also there's a little squishiness now about how frequently they're updated versus tagging. So it's a little tricky. But in general, yeah, you can get that. So I mean, these are the idea. Of, you know, old wine and or new. New wine and old bottles, these are not brand new issues, but there's new dimensions to the issues and uh, it makes you know, life easier for developers, but it makes it harder, harder to comply. Um, so again, just very quickly, you know, you, typically we look at compliance, you've got your product, and again, just saying, could be composed of many containers running or a single container, usually many. Typically, your customers want some simple representation of a software bomb, some quick look at what you provide. Uh, which is a little different from an attribution notice because the attribution notice is to the end user and you need to do something that source code redistribution. So these are not new issues, but the way you address them may be new. Um, and that kind of kind of wraps up my segment for now. So I was trying to, you know, to, to frame the issue. And again, it's basically about new ways of doing development and it's not been optimized for compliance. And so now there's kind of new um, variations <coughs> of old challenges that, that you're, you're facing. So Heather's going to talk about how, how that fits into sort of a bigger compliance picture. At the very end, I'll just talk about a couple ideas about how you can mitigate this, uh, the technical side. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, would you mind? Uh, there we go. So um, first of all, let me say that uh, if anybody has sort of more <coughs> questions about open source compliance generally, feel free to ask them. I'm not going to go through a whole presentation on it right now. Um, when you uh, use or redistribute software under open source licenses, you have certain requirements um, that are imposed by the licenses. Uh, they're actually properly called license conditions. And uh, if you don't comply with the license conditions, then you are at risk for a variety of things, <laughs> most notably uh, copyright infringement claims. Um, and orders to um, continue <coughs> use of the software. So, uh, of course, the conditions are very important. If you're using open source software in your products, you, um, my phone thinks I'm talking to it, for some reason. <laughs> um, then you have to comply with these conditions or you're going to have potential business and legal issues. Now, the level of risk that you have depends on what you're doing with the software. Most open source licenses don't impose any conditions unless you distribute the software. Uh, what distribution consists of uh, is sometimes not as clear as it might we might like it to be, but essentially if you transmit a copy of the software to someone else, like a customer, like a redistributor, um, someone who is not you, and, and if you are an entity, that means a different entity, um, then you all of the requirements of the open source licenses or the conditions kick in. Um, there are a few licenses that have some conditions in the absence of distribution, most notably a Faro GPL, which we just talked about uh, briefly a moment ago. And 
that category of licenses imposes the conditions of the open source licenses if you use the software in a way that allows people to interact with it over a network. Um, so there are basically three different categories of use cases and three different levels of risk that are associated with those categories. So the low, or we might even say zero risk, is if you're using open source software uh, within your business, but it is not uh, part of your product at all. So let's suppose you have some open source software that is a debugger. You know, that's generally not going to be in your product distribution. I won't say it never is because occasionally it is, but for most developers, <coughs> it's not in their product distribution. It's something that they're just using to develop the software. If you're using some open source software to monitor your computer network, that's to another example of something that would rarely be distributed uh, outside the company. So uses like that basically don't have risk associated with them because the conditions of the licenses never kick in with that kind of risk. And now I'm going to talk about, I don't know why this phone still thinks I'm talking to it. Uh, I did not press the button. Um, so uh, now let's talk about the high, high category of risk, and that is actually distributing the software to someone. So if you have a product and it's an on-premises product, so you're actually giving a copy of it to your customers or to resellers, that is clearly distribution and all of the conditions of the open source licenses will kick in whatever they may be. So if you are in the business of developing software applications, and you just deliver those to your customers on premises, um, then uh, you've got to deal with the requirements of the licenses. If you are uh, creating a mobile app, that's distribution, and you have to uh, comply with the conditions of the licenses. So those are situations, we would call them high risk, but I don't mean to imply overall that open source is exceptionally risky, because I don't actually think it is, but, um, but you do have to pay attention to compliance or else you could get yourself into trouble. There's a, a medium risk area, and that arises mainly because of this category of licenses that might impose conditions even for software as a service use or application service provider use or whatever we're calling it this week. Um, and there are maybe half a dozen licenses that do that. They are not applied to a ton of code compared to the others. We heard MongoDB inch, uh, mentioned, and that's probably because it's the poster child for the Afero GPL. It's, I think, by far, you can tell me if you have other ideas, but it is by far the most popular piece of software under that license. You just see it all the time. Um, so. That's sort of the medium area where you are, uh, you have open source software in your product, but you are not actually distributing your product. You're deploying it as a service. You're allowing people to interact directly with the open source software as part of your product. So with that in mind, let's go on to the next slide. So the reason we're here today talking about this is that if you had to invent a way to make open source <laughs> compliance more difficult, it would be something like containers. Um, the thing is that it is a challenge within an organization. Let, let's, let's go back to the quote unquote easy case. And that is you're developing some software that you're going to make into a product. And when you want to use some third party open source software, you say, okay, I'm going to take a look at the license. I'm going to see if it works for me. If it does, I'll put it in the product and I'm going to comply with the, the license requirements, which will always include delivering a notice, a license notice, and may have some requirements to say license on the same terms or uh, make offers to provide source code if it's a, a so-called copyleft license. So 
that is sort of the old way of doing things. And of course, people are still doing that things that way now. But the notion there is that you have this control over what's going into the product. Every time you put something into a product, you actually took an action to put it in there. Okay. So what Michael was mentioning about the thing about purchasing, I just want to underscore that because it's a really good point. You know, when open source software first got popular, you know, really popular, um, what people observed was that it circumvented the business processes of most organizations. So if you wanted to put some proprietary software in your product, you would go to the vendor, you'd get a license, you'd have to have someone agree to the license, and in that process it would go through legal or purchasing review or vote. And so you had some process control within your organization where someone looked at the license terms and made sure they worked and made sure you knew what license terms applied and then the decision was made to put the software in the product. When open source first got popular, the issue was that companies didn't have processes in place to control it and I think it's probably still fair to say that most companies really struggle with those processes even today. But the point is, your developers can get direct access to the software. There's no fee to pay. You know, there's no real barriers to putting it in the product from a technical point of view. And so it doesn't tend to get reviewed properly. So what companies have done in response to that is they've put internal processes in place saying, if you want to use open source software, someone has to be paying attention, look at the license terms and see if we can comply with them. And if we can comply with them, then we keep track of what we're using and what terms uh, cover the, the software, and then we comply with them and we have processes for all of those. So for the past you know, 15 years or so, a lot of companies have been spending a lot of time uh, struggling to put those processes in place. Um, now what's happening with some of the new uh, ways of deploying things, particularly containers, is that the developer is not even making a specific decision anymore what to include in the product. So they're just like slurping in all sorts of stuff that somebody else has put together and put in the product. So when you think about sort of the first instance I talked about where you're just trying to keep track of what you're using and that's enough of a challenge, one of the big challenges of that is that open source will, and any software will tend to have a lot of dependencies. So you bring in software A and then it brings in software B and so forth and so on. Um, and keeping track of that is a challenge. But when you're using a technology like this, it just becomes even more <coughs> opaque and by the way, easier, <laughs> right? Which is why the, the technology is popular the point is that the developer isn't even making the decision to bring the third-party software in anymore. Uh, so when you get to that situation, you have another breakdown in business processes. You, the, you know, we went through a phase where people were putting in processes to, to manage open source software <laughs> compliance, and now we sort of have to reset and think, okay, we need to put more processes in place Plus, we have to have a, a, enough transparency and visibility into what the public containers contain in order to make sure that we're going to be compliant. Uh, so um, when you uh, add something like Docker to your development process, you have usually become a Linux distribution supplier all of a sudden. So Let's just talk about that for a moment. So um, there have always been some companies who have delivered their products as quote unquote appliances. So even if that's a software appliance, it might be a hardware appliance, but the point is they're delivering an entire operating system and application stack from soup to nuts to their customers. Very common in certain industries where you have 
focus on security and so forth, where you really just want to deliver a whole virtual image and you don't want the customer like installing it at their site on their own. So people have, some people have been doing that for a while, but now everybody's doing that because when you're developing applications today, um, you're now deploying them with the stack of software beneath it and that is a lot of open source software. So if you think about what a Linux distro is, it is thousands of different files with thousands of different licenses. By the way, they should all be compliant with each other um, because that's what the Linux distros do. But the point is that invisible to the developer, there are many, many components of those systems. And so now, uh, companies who have been developing applications um, are now all becoming suppliers of distros and all the other software that is in the stack between the application and the operating system. So all of a sudden you are distributing all the software used to run your application, not just your application. Okay, so, so yeah. Heather, real quick, um, but if this is only being used for SaaS, and, and you didn't get any AGPL in there, in no Afero, then your yeah, obligations that, wouldn't kick in, It right? shouldn't be a problem. And so if you're talking about a Linux distro, it shouldn't have any AGPL stuff in right, it, right? right? Or else somebody's made a huge mistake. But um, there can be other stuff within the stack, like Mongo or something like that, where there could be an issue and you might have some trouble with visibility. Right. Um, so this is only, your, your statement here is, <clears throat> is only if you've just dis actually distributed something with Docker, not if you're using it in a SaaS model purely. Right. Not, not if you're not just running it. But distribution is distribution. Right. Right. But, we're, but <laughs> two, two quick comments there. I mean, uh -huh. we're seeing people use this as a distribution mechanism. So I mean, it's, okay. so it's becoming popular in the sense of I'm just going to use it this way because that makes my application easier for my customer yeah. to install, like the appliance. Oh, for an install. So, so it is not, software. I mean, it's most prominent sauce, but what we're starting to see is people actually using it that. And second trend we see on the cloud is clouds getting well enough known that lots of companies have said, I will never have a private cloud. <laughs> Guess what? You get a big enough customer and they dangle up money says, yeah, I'm going to ship you a copy of that whole cloud thing that I, I yeah. thought I was always going to run myself. Yeah. But you offer right. me enough money or you're demanding enough, I'm going to ship it. So, so there are shipment true. models That's here. absolutely true. I mean, every client who comes to me and says, well, I don't have any open source issues because I'm only doing SaaS. The, the first thing I say is, okay, that may be true today. Tomorrow it's not going to be true because somebody in your organization is going to come to you and say, I, we need to provide a, a, an instance or an appliance to this customer because they, their requirement is that they run it on their own. Yeah. And from a business point of view, Delivering SaaS served from your computers and delivering it as a private instance serving just for that one customer, from a business point of view, there's almost no di difference between those situations. From a legal <coughs> and licensing point of view, it is two entirely different worlds. And if you're an in-house lawyer and you are trying to make sure that your <coughs> company is complying with open source software licensing requirements, you do not want to be the person who says to that salesperson, you cannot do this deal because it would take us two years to get compliance on the open source software. Uh, so even if you're doing SaaS, I always recommend that you behave as if you might distribute the software. And so, you know, if you're using some tasty piece of GPL stuff that you can't really put in your application because it you know, interacts with it too intimately, um, then I always recommend that you have a substitute in mind. But um, I do think it's best to do compliance even for SAS, assuming that you are going to The other thing I'll say is that, I mean, application providers are using this all the time. So people who are doing on-premises application software licensing are doing this a lot. Question about the uh, MongoDB. So we cannot use MongoDB as part of any SaaS because it's a GPL? Uh, well, not no. exactly. No. Afero a GPL works a little bit differently in the sense that if you don't make changes 
to the software, you don't have the obligation to provide the source code. That's not the same as regular GPL. Regular GPL says if you distribute, whether you changed it or not, you have to make the source code available. A Faro GPL says if you change it and you make it available as a service, then you have to make source code available. So the delta between the two is changes and SAS use. It's not just SAS use. But the, the code source of the uh, MongoDB only that we change, not the source code of Correct. all the applications. And the reason for that, by the way, is that Mongo, um, and by the way, I think this is one of the reasons why their, their product has been popular, has actually said applications that use our database, they're not, you know, the licensing is not compromised by use of our database. They actually provide permissively licensed right. um, layers to go uh, between the application and, and their database software. <coughs> and they say, it's important that they say it because they're the author and therefore they have the right to say what they think about what the license means for their software. They say, your proprietary application can use our database and it can be, your application can remain proprietary. It's not a violation of AGPL. Yeah, because they explicitly license the APIs under a permissive license, as yeah. opposed to something like MySQL, where both the API and the database are under GPL. Yes. So, so it's distinctly different from that. So, I'm sorry, Heather, is there a uh, public statement or something of that nature, or is it just implicit in the licensing of the, app, the it's, node it, library? Or the it's software? on their website. Okay. And many lawyers have relied on it heavily, even though it's perhaps stated in a somewhat informal way. Yeah. <laughs> also, you know, about Mongo in particular, you can get a commercial license from them and it's not terribly expensive. So if the lawyers are still, you know, panicked over the issue of using AGPL, then um, you can go and get a, a commercial license and, and it's, <coughs> the last time I looked, reasonably priced and a pretty good license. Um, so they do dual licensing, which you know makes it even easier to solve them. So it was still about ten thousand dollars, I think. Yeah. So which which is nothing for a huge company using it, but for a startup that that was using it, it might be an issue for them. Yeah, I I have found that um, among my clients, at least, almost nobody is modifying the software, so most of them really don't care that much. Um, by the way. A Faro GPL is a variant of GPL3, and there are issues associated with GPL3, um, so it doesn't get rid of those issues. But as far as compliance goes, it's um, it's usually functionally not a big issue. I've never had an issue with Mongo that couldn't be solved in a reasonable way. Um, that's not true of something like MySQL, which is you know can potentially a big issue in um, in compliance. Yeah, and you're talking a lot more than $10,000. <laughs> yes, and that's why, right? It's gotten very expensive, the license has so gotten very expensive. So the question is, the, um, so Docker Hub, they buy all these base image. So are they under this, uh, they become like Linux distro? Well, they are, in fact, a Linux distro, but they just don't have the usual artifacts. So <coughs> if you take a regular non-Docker CentOS image, it comes with the source and all the notices, right? They just I mean, it's a huge download, but it's all together. That's the way they normally do it. So this is a streamlined subset. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a really imp another important point is that um, when you distribute binaries of, say, GPL software, um, you have to include separate license notices. So if you take, like, a Linux distribution in source code form and you redistribute it to someone else, the license notices are all baked in there because they're actually in the source code files. If you compile that, build it, and turn it into a binary image and distribute it, you still have to provide the notices, and but they're not in there. So you have to actually go and get them, put them together, and deliver them. And I have to say that I probably spend more time counseling clients on that issue than the more kind of complex and interesting open source compliance issues because the the administrative work involved in collecting potentially hundreds of notices from a that that uh, apply to a binary it's a lot of work 
The other thing is that, as you heard Michael say, there, there aren't build scripts or anything like that. And one thing that people forget is that GPL um, obligates you not only to make the source code available, but build scripts as well. And so when you get an image like this, it contains none of the ancillary information that you need in order to comply with the license. So the industry has not yet figured out how that's going to work. So but on this scenario, it's Docker Hub is responsible. Docker is responsible for that. Do they provide the notification? Center OS. No, it's no. I mean, Docker is Docker's a registry. They just it's a place you can put it. Okay, so yeah. we're putting. Well, you can argue CentOS is required, but they don't have to do anything. They're an open source project, and they do yeah, whatever they, they want. They're making the source code available. Oh, they're making the source code. Okay. Yeah, but, but they're not actually complying with GPL. You know, it's it's a good question. Here's <coughs> the question. If I am making source code for some GPL software available and binaries, and I say to you, I'll give you both of these if you want them, um, up front, uh, the question is, do I also have to provide separate notices for the binaries? And there's sort of a difference of opinion on that. Some people take a functional view and say, well, if you offered up the source code, there were the notices, you know. Other people say, well, if you're, if you, the way the, uh, the license actually reads says, if you distribute binaries, you have to provide the notices. And some people read that as you have the source code and the binary with notices. Some people read it as the notices are baked into the source code. You don't have to provide them again. So, so with respect to an open source project like CentOS, um, they're distributing the source code. And I don't think people are likely to challenge them on that. But if you are a private company redistributing, you're sort of more likely to get challenged. But I'm, I'm more uh, like concerned about the user who is putting an image on the uh, Docker Hub registry. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he didn't he strip out all the notices, all the source code. Well, we there's, there's also no culture of contributing those notices with your contribution to the repo. I think that's really the problem is that the, the the culture has not built up around how to do that properly. And and with open source, if you get software from a source that hasn't complied and you redistribute it, you're just as responsible as the person upstream. And so you inherit any problems that have been baked into what you got. So this was your, your problem. If you take any of this image, basically you are responsible for... Yeah, you, you are, you're the point of responsibility because yes. you're distributing something to your customer. You, you know, no you, one you, knows what is inside of it. <laughs> it's well. We're trying. For, our experience says it's hard to figure out exactly. And again, part of the GPL and and the LGPL is you have to do the same version. You know, there's the source for that version. Yeah. So you can have 16 copies. You could have layers with 16 different copies of grep, with 16 SHA ones. Who the heck knows which version of grep is which, right? So I, I'm not saying anyone's going to get trouble at that particular point. I'm just saying that's where the problem comes in. You could pull a single command, you know, stand or a busy box or something, and you could see the files and say, I know this is busy box, I see it a lot of time. But which version is it? If someone wants the source, how do you actually give them the correct source? I mean, you could give them something you, you could try, but I'm just saying it in terms of compliance, that's the whole beauty of all the work that goes into these distros, right? There's huge documentation of every version and, and, and so on. And it's just, this is a shortcut, right? It's a shortcut that makes everything move faster. How do we, how do we get all the benefits of that shortcut and, and not leave the um, you know, the compliance side of it behind. Thank you. Heather, on your point about providing the note, if, if you're a company that just provides the, the bin soup to nuts binary, uh, the notices you should be providing include all the copyright notices for all the Linux uh, uh, contributors? Theoretically. So that could be thousands, right? Yes. There are thousands, thousands of copyright notices. Oh, yes. It's not oh, just copyright file. notices, yeah. it's license yeah. notices. So it's basically delivering all the license files, right. text files. That but you don't have to repeat the GPLv2 a thousand. No, no. But you could have you could have you could have a hundred variants of the BSD and MIT license notices inside files. Yeah. So for uh, for things like BSD and MIT, they're they're inconsistent. So you have to include all of them. For GPL, there's only one version of GPL. So you don't have to include them like a zillion copies. The fact is that when people do notices, they sometimes do that anyway because 
it's easier to do that than to figure out how many copies of Apache 2 or GPL2 or GPL3 you have in there um, and take them out if they're irrelevant. So sometimes people actually over notice. And that's not non-compliant, it's just irritating for anyone actually going through the notices <laughs> to try to figure out what's in there. There, there are also, it's, it's very confusing, and this is because open source you know, practice has confused it. There are copyright notices in there too, so literally copyright whatever, Apache Software Foundation, and those are actually in the licenses. And it is not common to extract those out, even though if you read the licenses, some of them kind of sound like you might have to do that. Mostly what people, what people do is they just take the <coughs> license they got with the software, it's a text file, and they just pass it on. And that is going to be compliant in almost all cases. Uh, so, uh, so that's the practice. But as you can imagine, people hate doing that with binaries. First of all, they're irritating to put together. There isn't enough automation to suck them out of the source code repository. And uh, also, depending on, on the, um, the context, is sometimes, even though they're just text files, um, they, can, uh, they can slow down delivery of the software by a download. Uh, there are some applications where people just don't want to include the notices because they're basically kind of too fat. So, um, so it, it can be an issue. There is actually one bright light in that is the Debian project has done an unbelievably good yeah. job of creating their own Debian copyright and license file for each major package. I mean, if it's in the Debian distro, it may not be exactly right. They They've also actually have some auto an automated, uh, uh, isn't it wrapped into their build system? Yeah, it's wrapped it, in yeah. their build system, and Philippe tells me it's automated. So I'm saying they're, they're kind of, you know, they're the very public interest oriented, and it doesn't really have a commercial <coughs> arm. But they've actually created in, in for all the Linux packages a nice well it's, it's automated but it's actually readable to a human and for a particular you know also sound library will list all the notices and the components they apply to in kind of a long text file so that's actually uh, the, you know, the easiest thing if you wanted to have the data but um, they're the only ones who do that Red Hat does not. Yeah. The that. Android system has some good automation too, but Debian's definitely yeah, but the, uh, the, uh, the best. The Android system repeats the full text of the Apache software license hundreds of times. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's um, okay, well, let's go on to yep. the next one. Uh, yeah, so I think we've kind of already talked about this, but you've got to figure out how to deal with all this stuff. and. And it's not 100% clear how to do that. Michael, maybe make yeah, a few okay, comments okay. about this. Um, so, Michael, I'm just going to hand it over to okay. you at this point because I think I've talked about everything that was on this okay. slide. Well, let me, yeah, so, so, you know, we're on the same page saying you need to, you know, the first thing uh, in all this is to start thinking about what the changes to your approach may be if you're doing any kind of Docker-based distribution. As, as Heather said, I mean, there's, there's a beautiful use case to use Docker to quickly spin up virtual machines for testing inside your environment. I mean, that's a great use case, and it doesn't have any of these issues. But the case we're talking about is something that you, you ship. Um, so there are some basic things that, that I'll come to talk about. And so there's a top-level view of just you know, making people in your organization aware to start thinking about it. It's not like to shut it, shut it off, but what we're finding in, in our practice is <coughs> the adoption of a Docker is leaping ahead of of people and the legal and the business management side being aware of these potential issues. So there are some things you can do. Um, one of them is, is, is more general, which is, is provisioning controls or, or sometimes called vendoring. So much as many companies have come around and said, no, I don't want to go to Maven Central anymore. I want a controlled repository. And this is big companies like Google and many other companies. Um, you know, there, there are many, many different repositories out there, but there's various ways you can control each of those repositories. So you have a controlled version. And you can also do other good engineering things like maybe start down, you know, uh, decreasing the amount of proliferation of, of versions that you don't really need. Um, but so there's kind of a general um, point. And then the more specific point is to really, if you're going to use a public image, do some introspection, figure out how clear the licensing is, who it comes from, how often it's updated, that sort of thing. And again, there's, I don't know, 
it's under 50 right now, major ones on Docker Hub, but but you know those will vary quite a bit according to what the project decides to do. So uh, a project like CentOS or Linux distro is a huge number of contributors. Uh, there are other uh, components out there that are much narrower. That's all coming from the same company, right? That's they you know they maintain control of the project as Docker has, so it has very consistent licensing. You you, you just don't know. Um, a key uh, recommendation for us is, is really think hard about building your own base image. So again, it comes back to the point I made earlier. Someone decided to start with CentOS 6 public image, and it turns out most of what they need is in CentOS 7. There's going to be all these Docker file commands and all these layers to upgrade everything to, to CentOS 7. And it's probably happening somewhat differently across the different images, right? Because they may need slightly different stuff. So you really need to think about why would I build my own base image? It's not trivial, but it's not that hard. And then have a plan that says when it comes to a point where we really need CentOS 7, then we need a CentOS 7 based image. We shouldn't be constantly, you know, in each stack or each kind of vertical image doing the various commands that I need to do to um, update it. You could also take a strategy of, of, of sharing images. So, you, you know, images can be built on images. So I could take a base, I could still add a different image. So, you know, if you have a, a JDK that you want to use, you could decide not necessarily put it in your base image, but make everyone aware that you have a standard you know, current Oracle, I mean, current J, what, 8U, whatever image, and everybody should be using that image. So I still get all the Docker stuff, but it does require some coordination, so six different teams don't use slightly different versions of the open JDK. So there's, there's a variety of strategies, but it's basically a combination of getting control over the images and the layers and, and setting standards for, for where code comes from that's being pulled into a particular image. Um, so again, you know, if you have a machine that's shut down and can't access the internet, you may not have this problem, but that's not really practical otherwise. Quick question on the first point. So is it clear on the Docker Hub which image are like kind of certified? No, there's yet? no certification yet. Okay. Um, there's, been, there's been visibility lately about security issues. So again, do I have OpenS, what was the OpenSSH? They have a new big security hole with OpenSSH, right? It's no, it's not at all clear. Okay. So if we need to, uh, if we want to, we, Use one of these images, we have to do our own due diligence. Due diligence and probably talk to the project team and see where they go. So, I mean, again, there are, there are images that are like more middleware layers or higher layers. And again, they may come from exactly one team and they don't pull in a lot of third party relative to them. That might be much, much safer. Maybe even MongoDB, right? So, MongoDB is its own thing and it's controlled by the Mongo people. So, it's, it's more isolated yeah. than it versus many other things could be. So, so just first, just go in there. What is this image? Who's where does it come from? Um, do they even say anything about licensing on the page? Do they say anything about how they do it? You know, there's nothing technically in Docker that prevents you from including notices. It's just not nothing that makes it easy, and there's no, you know, it's kind of like GitHub with all the li projects that don't have licenses. It's, it's just not done. It's not a, no, a norm yet to do it that way, so it, you're going to see a lot. So just I, it's really be careful about it, think about it, and again, you know, the, understand that a lot of these are somewhat moving targets. So if you're using one of those core technologies, you might want to make the investment to build your own image. You're probably pretty familiar with CentOS or Ubuntu or whatever, and you can get that from the core project. And you just and you maybe they'll even help you. You know, you can look at the Docker files they use to create it. So you could, you know, you know, you can usually get access to their Docker files. So you could, you know, most of the pieces are there, but then you can build it in a controlled environment. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. You don't have to reinvent the whole thing. Or if they don't post their Docker files, Docker files are not in the image itself, but typically people will share those. You could just ask them for it. That might be something they'd be quite willing to do. So, so it's just it's, it's really that control issue. So this is kind of general <coughs> purpose, and then it's like you know on steroids with Docker that you need to be thinking about where third-party code comes from, and again these dependency commands and these install and install commands. Uh, you know, I think we should probably wrap up. Yeah, this is the first. Um, and then uh, give people a yeah. little time to. So yeah, this, this is the last the last slide here. So basically, just these are some specific things, and when you get a copy of the slides, it'll be more detailed. But there are some specific things you can do today in terms of logging, um, enhancing the commands in the Docker file to keep copies of things as you go. Um, and, and there's some you know we at Nextbee are happy to talk to people about. So, so there's various ways you could augment because the Docker files themselves are pretty powerful, pretty open ended. You could do specific things that aren't standardized. But you could do things to deal with each of these and, and to simplify the commands too. I mean, sometimes we see this command that just it's going all over creation, doing various things. So there's lots of very practical sort of, you know, it'd be like setting standards. If you had a, a build system, 
there are standards that evolve over time to keep it clean and, and, and well organized, and, and you could apply those things here. So these are, uh, when you get the slides, you'll see some more specifics, but there are some very specific things you can do, but there's no nothing really baked in for you. You have to intelligently use the facilities to do that. So um, this is our view, you know, it's uh, laws of physics still apply. Uh, time to update and adapt your policies. It's, it's good stuff. Containers are good stuff, doctors good stuff, but better to be ahead of the curve than be the one caught either in a legal situation or some other form of embarrassment in the technology community because of something you didn't intend to do, uh, but someone someone found it. So, so just w one point. So yeah, we talk about the distribution. It's So if it's on the distribution, basically you are responsible for it. It's not like if you run it or if you use a component inside it, you're responsible. It's, as long as it's on your distribution, you're responsible for it. Yeah, it, it all flows downstream. So if you distribute it, you inherit those, and hopefully people upstream help you. Even if you never you run the component, use the fact to distribute it. Yeah, that is actually, well, Heather knows more than I, but but there's differences between copyright and patents relative to things being distributed. And I think for patents, you have yeah. to run it. Copyrights, yeah. for if you copyright, distribute it. If you distribute, then, and you have not complied with the licenses, you're an infringer. And uh, it, unfortunately, uh, most of the open source licenses have no cure opportunity. Uh, it's pretty draconian. So if you violate the license, it just terminates automatically. So then you're unlicensed and you're an infringer. And, and you cannot point to upstream people to avoid liability there you know, variety of cases that actually have said that. And it's a real issue because companies get stuff from their suppliers that isn't compliant and then they redistribute it and then the enforcers come after them. <coughs> and then, you know, and then they may not even be able to get the source code from their suppliers and so forth. So it's, you can p potentially get squeezed pretty badly. Yeah, I mean, you may have a recourse to pressure your supplier, but you're the, you're the one holding the bag, right? You're the one who has to deal with the problem, and then you have to figure out how else you can get help. Is help. anyone shi shipping Docker files with access to a private registry for the intermediaries and leaving end users to go and get Linux, get Fedora, get CentOS from Docker itself, essentially to build on their side? Well, not exactly, because again, the image is already pre-built. There's no there's no dyna dynamism to building image. So once the image is built, it's frozen. So there's exactly. a certain amount of intermediacy, right? If you pull the base okay. image and then you build two different images on top of it, essentially okay. you build one application on CentOS 7, you build another application on CentOS 7. I know that the client software has cached the base image by hash. You don't have to download it from public registry again. Oh, so is there oh, some kind of delta? That, well, there's a whole, yeah. So one of the biggest problems we have mm -hmm. in doing audits, and one of the comments that didn't come through here, and I don't know if it's good or bad for our businesses, this is not a, an audit solvable problem. The audits on this, we will do them, but they are extremely arduous. You've got to get on the front end. There's many facilities inside Docker where actually they reuse, if, you, if you're building something and it's cached something, it reuses it from the cache. But that makes the traceability even harder. So my, I guess yeah. what I was going to is can we avoid distributing the distribution, the distro, by leaving, I mean, now what we do is we say we're CentOS 7 compatible. You yeah. can run it on CentOS. We're not giving you CentOS. Right. You have to go get it from the guys in progress talks. Or well, it depends what you put in your, you know, so you could have a very simple base image. It doesn't have any Linux stuff in it. There's no rule that it has to have anything in it if you're happy with what's on the kernel, what's on the base operating system. So you can avoid that by, by getting a really solid, I mean, you got the kernel underneath, right? So, so the amount of software you'd actually need to interact with the kernel could be very limited. If you're thinking about it. So I guess I'm wondering about that use case where say there's a node application on top of a that's just you sent us keep rolling with it. Um, Docker, if you're using Docker on the receiving end, you've got devs on that side too. So if you send them a Docker file and you provide the intermediate binary, but you leave them to go and download CentOS for themselves to compile. Well, if you ship binary. the Docker files and they run the build, that's a different game. Okay. That, don't you get yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. talking here about the, you're you're building just, the image and distributing the image. Yeah. You could eat some of the philosophical basis of Docker, though, which is, you know, portability without having... Well, and ready to run. But yeah. that you certainly, I mean, that would be another way of, sort of like when you tell somebody uh, there's a prerequisite for something. And I, I, guess I just wonder if anyone's doing that to try to get around distribution. I haven't heard, I haven't heard about that. I, know, I don't, well, I think... Yeah, yeah I, I mean, so, so that's kind of the old way of 
doing things, and people have definitely done that in the past, but this, but this way of deploying software basically makes that, you know, it's, it's just antithetical to that. It, it's not really a full adoption of the Docker yeah. philosophy. You could do it, but mm -hmm. it's not the reason that, that this system exists. Well, thanks, well, everyone. We'll thanks be around for, for a few yeah, minutes. We'll and, uh, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be around for a while if you'd like to chat. Some and you'll, we'll, we'll send out a copy of the slides with the additional speaker notes to everyone. Pierre. Pierre. Okay, Pierre. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.